Hey guys, this is Kevin Kim with Precision Powerlifting Systems. I'm actually going to try something a little bit uh, different today. I'm going to try to record this as a podcast as well as a YouTube video. So whichever forum you like to listen to this stuff, hopefully it can be available in both places. But it could work against me and it could suck in both places. So we'll see. So today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about being process oriented. So you've heard me say embrace the process a number of times. And I think you see other coaches say this quite a bit on the internet. Um, and it's just something that I think in professional sports, you hear them say a lot. So I do think there's a major misconception with what this means and how we actually communicate this to our lifters, athletes, whatever it is that you're coaching. So for me, I've always embraced the process in my head, but I have never I haven't been very good at actually coaching it that way. And there's always been this, as a coach, I think you kind of get stuck in between these two worlds where you want to put yourself out there on the internet to try to drum up more business. And at the same time, you want to do certain things that make people happy so that they keep giving you money, right? Especially like for me, this is what I do as a living. I don't, I only coach powerlifting. I don't do anything else. So it's not like, you know, if I had a typical nine to five job and I just did powerlifting coaching as a part-time gig, it might be a little bit easier for me to be able to relax and kind of do some of these other things, which in the beginning, especially as a newer coach, you just, you get so concerned that you're not going to make people happy and that they're going to stop coming to you for coaching. So even though I've always had this process oriented mindset, I absolutely was not coaching in that manner at any point up until pretty recently, actually. So for me, where this started to become a revelation was when the pandemic started last March and everybody was forced to stay inside and gyms were closed. I had at the time I had 51 lifters. So I had a huge stable of lifters. So I was bringing in decent money. I was overwhelmed with work. I was extremely busy. And like some of these things kind of just like go by the wayside. And I think there were times when I actually like sat down and reflected, there were a lot of times where it's like, I think I put pressure on myself for somebody to hit a five pound PR, to hit PRs and all of their lifts in order to justify my worth as a coach. And then when I was sitting down when the pandemic hit to really like reflect on what it means to be a good coach, what a good coach actually is. And I started to think of the good coaches I've had in the past. I started to think about my behavior the behavior of the lifters that I had that have always done well and the ones that always struggled and kind of just combine and not combining, but comparing their character traits. I then decided to what better place to look to figure out what good coaching actually is than to read books from good coaches. So I read John Wooden's book, Nick Saban's book, um, Pete Carroll's book, Anson Dorrance's book. Um, there was a documentary with Bill Belichick and Nick Saban that I watched. Like there's a lot of information out there with really good coaches that have kind of just put their process out there for everybody to read and learn and all of those things. So they all kind of say, oh, Bill Walsh was another one. I read his book. They all kind of say the same things like to be process oriented. So like if you do these things well, the score takes care of itself. And even like, you know, even for somebody like John Wooden, when he was talking about it or any of them, I mean, they're in, they're in sports where there is a defined winner and a loser, right? But if you do everything to the best of your capabilities, you've had a successful, you can't control the external outcomes. You've had a successful um, competition or a game or whatever it is. And the whole idea is to get the most potential out of the people that are in front of you. And they all said, here's how you do this. Here's our process of doing this. You need to focus on the, on the things that you can control and let the external outcomes take care of themselves. But in terms of powerlifting, and especially as a young coach, when there's pressure to make money from, you know, John Wooden at UCLA, his basketball players weren't paying him to be a coach. He was being paid by the school. So if, he's, if he has this process-oriented approach that the administrators of the school and the athletic director of the school likes, yes, wins and losses ultimately are going to determine his professional status at an institution. But if they like what they see there, they're going to keep him around. 
right? Where if I have a lifter that doesn't hit PRs, are they going to fire me? Right. And these thoughts are always going through our minds. So as a coach to be process oriented, there's this, there's this trust and belief you need to have that this is the right thing and that doing the right thing ultimately is going to bring you the highest levels of success. So I had 51 lifters. We go into the pandemic. I lost about half of my group and a lot of people who ended up not lifting again were people that it caught me off guard. I was like, wow, this is weird. I never saw this person stopping lifting weights. So when I started like really thinking about it, it's like, man, if we really want to get the greatest potential out of each lifter, they need to be able to stick with it long enough. Right. And if we stick with it long enough, there's things that we need to do at a baseline level in order to build long-term success. So with anything, you probably get this three to five window where you can just do whatever and you can still increase your, your capabilities within the sport. But after that three to five year window, where do you go from there? And I think in a lot of cases, a lot of lifters haven't been set up well in a way, both mentally and physically, to overcome that three to five year mark that kind of hits, right? So you have all that progress. Once that stops, I think a lot of lifters just haven't been given the proper skills to know how to make that next step once that baseline level of potential is met. So I've used this analogy before. So if we take everybody and we line them on a baseline here, and based off of genetic factors and what they've done previously, past sports experience, past lifting experience, all of that, everybody takes a step forward based off of every positive thing that they have going for them at this current moment in time. And then there's a finish line way off in the distance. So some people are gonna start closer to that finish line than others, but everybody has the potential to be the best versions of themselves that they can possibly be, to get as close to that finish line as possible. And the thing is, is in the real world, that finish line is gonna be in different spots for everybody. And what we can do to bring that finish line to the same spot is we make it a more arbitrary thing to achieve, right? So we'll be, you know, for me, so as a coach, the arbitrary big overreaching goal of precision powerlifting systems that I have is to make every lifter I coach great. And for me, that's really important because it to get somebody to really recognize their true potential, there's so many things that have to happen. And it has to happen over a prolonged period of time, right? There has to be a struggle and there has to be an understanding of the struggle and a want to get beyond that struggle and then to find the next struggle and do the same thing again. And it's, it's a very, it's a tough process. And I think oftentimes as coaches, we want people to be happy and have fun all the time. And I think what we need to really do is we need to develop the skills to show where it's not necessarily fun and happiness that we're looking for, but it, it's something else. It's this deep seated joy. I'm going to use joy as the example instead of happiness here. And I'm literally making this up on the spot, but it's this deep seated joy within us of embracing a struggle, challenging our character, challenging our physical and mental skills and seeing how, how, how great we can truly be at the end of this and at the end of this journey, right? That there's this underlying joy and it's not this, this happiness or this fun or this, but it's just this universal joy that can come from that process. But there has to be a foundational level of mental and physical skills that allow that to happen. So one of the biggest reasons for this, is our brain responds differently, differently to whether we view something as a challenge or a threat. So we constantly want to challenge ourselves and our beliefs in the gym, right? And even outside of the gym, I think there's a lot of things we can do outside of the gym that can yield positive effects going into, the, into training and into competition. But what we got to be careful of doing is seeing those situations as a threat. So I'm going to use a powerlifting example here that I think a lot of people can probably relate to. So let's say you run a lot of submaximal training in in training, right? You're coming up to a competition and the most that you touch is a single at around 90%, 95% or something, right? Just to get used to feeling heavier weights because you've been told by the internet not to, not to test in the gym or to max out in the gym that you only max out on the platform. And not that this is bad advice, but there has to be certain tools that allow that advice to be, to be productive in terms of output. So let's say you have these beliefs. And now you go to a competition, right? And you're putting weight on the bar that you've never put on the bar before. Do you feel challenged or do you feel threatened? If you feel threatened, your performance is going to suffer majorly. 
And if you don't have the mental skills to recognize the mistakes that you're making, to be like, hey, I don't have the confidence to do this. I haven't earned the right to do this because all confidence, confidence is, it's your positive self-talk, but it's believable self-talk. It can't be, you know when you're full of shit. You can't just tell yourself, I got this and it just happens. You have to earn the right to do difficult things. So you got to tell yourself that you got this after putting yourself into difficult positions and challenging yourself on a continual basis in training so that you've earned the right to do that difficult thing. And if you haven't earned the right to do that difficult thing and you haven't challenged yourself appropriately, because challenging yourself is a skill. And it's a skill that gets better at doing it over and over and over again. And if you haven't done that, there's going to be a lot of situations where you go in and now instead of being challenged, you feel threatened. And when you feel threatened, the hormonal response, the neural pathways, they're not the same ones that come with high performance movement or high performance skill in anything. So you're literally creating an entirely different neural pathway, utilizing a different neural pathway, a different hormonal sequencing system than you would be for high performance because you feel threatened and you haven't put yourself in the positions to feel challenged. So I think in a lot of cases, people get turned away from this sport because at some point they just continuously feel threatened and it gets easier to not do it anymore than it is to stick with it. So we've got to make sure we're challenging people just slightly beyond their skill set, not to a point where they actually feel threatened. So challenging ourselves is really important. And when I was further reflecting about kind of just what's the point of all this, right? This is a fucking amateur sport that nobody makes money at. Right? Nobody's making a living being a professional power lifter. We all have other jobs. We do this because we enjoy it. And at the end of the day, sports can teach a lot of valuable life lessons. Right? It builds a lot of mental and physical characteristics. We live in a world where you can't challenge yourself as much anymore. Like It's not like we have to go out and hunt for our food. Right? We live in a world of comfort. In order to challenge ourselves, we need to get uncomfortable. So sport can actually give us an outlet to be uncomfortable, to challenge ourselves and to develop some of these character traits, these physical and mental skills that are necessary for us to do better at everything and just to have a more fulfilled life at the end of the day. So when I started like putting all of that stuff together and just really thinking like, man, one, we need to somehow get people to stick around in that sport. How do we do that? And if they do stick around longer, we need to have them in a position where they can get prolonged results. Because let's face it, if we don't set them up well after that first three to five year period where those beginner gains kind of go away, now what? If their technique sucks, if their mental skills are weak, right? So you get some people who are just naturally physically strong. And these are the people you see on the internet where it's like, today's, today's lifts were fucking trash. This sucks, that sucks. And they're just complaining all the time. They're weak mentally. They're not gonna survive long enough in the sport because at some point that frustration is gonna win and they're gonna quit. So we need to set them up, one, in a technical standpoint that allows them to lift the most weight. And in a, from a mental standpoint, we need to give them the tools to embrace the struggle so that the struggle doesn't end up taking over them. There's, you have to set them up to control the moment so that the moment doesn't control them. And you're going to be constantly challenged, especially in an individual sport that tends to be very oriented on the internet. So you're posting stuff and you're being judged based upon your performance. But all you see, so if you're watching somebody at a meet and whether they make or they miss that lift, that's all you're seeing is that snapshot in time, that three to five second period of them attempting a lift. You don't see the months leading up to that. You don't know what's leading up to that other than what they tell you on the internet. So they could tell you they're doing all of these things, but they're skipping accessories. They don't sleep well. There's a number of factors going into that. Maybe they're really scared and they just can't admit it to themselves. And if they can't admit that to themselves and they're constantly trying to, their ego is constantly saying, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm this badass power lifter. At some point, the world is always going to give you the information. Right? And if you're not willing to listen to that information, you're going to butt heads with that information and you're going to try to explain it away in a number of different ways. That's where the blame game comes in. It's this program, it's that judge, it's the water cut, it's the stress, it's the, there's always going to be an excuse. And at some point the excuses get old and you're just not going to want to do it anymore. So it's going to be this baseline level of mental and physical skills that we need to give lifters to be able to survive long term in this sport. A long enough term where they can really develop a lot of character traits that sports can build. Sports don't build character in just a year. Sports builds character by having to go through a struggle. 
and most people won't get to the point of really struggling. And I, I'm not talking about, oh, I haven't hit a PR in six months. That's not a real fucking struggle. I'm talking about get fucking hurt and have to come back from that, from that injury to really do well again. Um, or have a really tough situation, right? Where you go two years without a PR. Like I want a real struggle, not this like, oh, I haven't hit a PR in six months or a year. That's not a real struggle. There's a lot of things that you're probably just not doing well and you're just not being honest with yourself in order to actually um, see the progress that you wanna make beyond a certain point. So again, we need to make sure we're laying these foundational mental and physical skills. So then I started thinking, what, can, what are those skills? Like what are our mental and physical skills that we need? I'm gonna start with the physical. So the internet likes to give me shit because of saying, you should squat with a little bit wider of a stance. I'm not talking about a raw lifter using a multiply squat stance. I'm talking about your heels slightly outside of your shoulders. Shoulder width is slightly outside for a raw lifter. And you have all these internet coaches that love the closer stance. And that's fine. Some people are going to be stronger that way. I'm not forcing people to lift in these positions, but I'm forcing them to build these positions. And yeah, maybe for a while they're competing with a more narrow stance, but your wide stance is going to build your narrow stance. Your narrow stance builds a deadlift. So heel shoulder width slightly outside. The reason for this is the distance, right? So strength at the end of the time, it's how, how much weight can I move over a certain distance? I can get stronger by shortening the distance. I don't need to actually increase my strength. I just need to be more efficient. So if I can move weight less of a distance, to me, you're never going to tell me that that's, that that's wrong. There's no way in, you know, I understand people use their, you know, they try to explain everything away in like a logical evidence-based way. But at the end of the day, you're not going to convince me that moving a weight a further distance is a better approach to the long term. So ultimately, if you want to move the most weight you can possibly move, manipulate the range of motion to the best of your abilities and train the fucking shit out of those angles that require that and those muscles that are required at those angles. And then we get to the bench press. And shortest distance between a straight line. I know that's an argument that people are like, well, the pecs and the delts have a more biomechanical advantage when the weight's coming over the face. That may be true, okay? Shortest distance between, a straight line, uh, between two points is a straight line. So yeah, maybe the pecs and the delts have greater um, leverage when the bar is going back like that. And I have many coaches that, I know many coaches that I respect a lot that teach it that way. I prefer a straight bar path for a couple of reasons. And I mean, this is basically straight from Louis Simmons. I agree with what he has to say with this. You just don't see people hurting their triceps ever in raw bench pressing, ever. I've never seen it. Shoulders and pecs though get really banged up. And the people that I've seen with the shoulder and pec injuries in training that limit the amount of work we can do. At some point, capacity fucking matters in the gym. What you're capable of handling in the gym ultimately leads to how much success you have later on. And as a coach, our job is to increase that capacity, right? So if I have lifters that when they get the hard elbow flare and they're getting a lot of pec and shoulder strains that decrease their capacity for work in the gym, I don't care if they can lift more in those positions. Over the long term, I'm gonna have a hard time increasing that capacity. And when you talk about like individualizing training and all of that stuff, and I've spoken of this before, yes, you meet them with where they're at and they may be stronger in those positions. The bar path will probably never be perfectly straight, but if you're trying to develop a perfectly straight bar path and you're really using a lot of arm strength, it saves the shoulders. So not only is the distance gonna be less, but it just bangs up the shoulders a lot less. And to be honest, once I started, I, we stopped pausing a lot in training and we started really focusing on a straight bar path. We struggled with the bench press as a group for a very long time. And then Jeremy Hartman kind of, he convinced me, like, he's like, this is why. And he has a lot of lifters, like female junior lifters that are lifting a shitload of weight in the bench press. And I'm like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So we started utilizing those same techniques and our bench presses have blown up. They're no longer our weakest lift. In some cases, they're the ones that tend to see the greatest amount of progress. And yes, maybe the pecs and the delts don't have as much leverage, but our arms are stronger to make up for that. And we're able to handle more 
capacity. We have a higher capacity of handling weights in the gym because our shoulders and our pecs aren't getting banged up the same way as they were before. And you know, I, part of it too is as a coach, the ones who have that strong elbow flare, I've paid attention to making sure our heavy stuff might be with boards or short and range of motion and put them in positions where they kind of get punished with that elbow flare. So they really can't put a lot of, um, a lot of stress on those tissues of the shoulder joint. And then when we get to the deadlift, so this is where everybody's gonna be like, well, some people pull more conventional and that's a longer lift. Yes, but I wanna build up that sumo deadlift because I honestly think everybody's gonna end up pulling more with the sumo deadlift at some point. Um, so we've really, I've had quite a few lifters that have pulled more sumo, I mean, that have pulled more conventional and we've really just built up the sumo deadlift in the background. Um, and we've hit all time PRs now in the sumo deadlift. So it's just something that you're building up in the background. You still let them compete conventional, but you're building up those angles. And then when you're starting to use the sumo deadlift and you're starting to use the box squats and wider stance squats, and you're trying to like really like build that stuff. Now your squat and your deadlift complement each other really well. And you can really start to put together some, some nice progress on the lifts. This doesn't mean we don't ever train close stance stuff. We do a lot of close stance stuff as like accessory work. Um, and we'll even throw it in at times for like our rep work and stuff like that if it's a glaring weakness that I see needs to be addressed. And you want to be strong at all angles because you really don't, I'm not huge into the, oh, an asymmetry is going to lead to injury type of message. But at some point, the difference in strength in different angles is probably going to bite you in the ass. And whether it's you get hurt pulling sumo and you haven't pulled conventional and now your numbers are way down, um, it could be something like that. But also it's just, there is some, there is a breaking point. So if your legs are so much stronger than your low back in a squat, at some point you're going to put a weight on your back that exceeds the tissue tolerance of your lower back and you're going to get fucked up. The risk of that increases if there's not this, it doesn't necessarily have to be perfectly symmetrical, but you need to be addressing all areas of the lifts, not just playing to your strengths. You need to build your weaknesses. So once I kind of came up with those like technical heuristics of here's how we're going to build the lifts because it manipulates the range of motion to the best of our abilities. And it is truly something that I believe will set people up for long-term success, right? Beyond that three to five year period, what do we need to do to get better? This is what we're going to do. Um, and believe it or not, your sumo deadlift going up is going to make your conventional going up, right? You're, and we do obviously a ton of closer grip bench work and we don't do a ton of like wide grip bench stuff, we might have like typical like comp grip bench press on one day of the week or whatever, but bringing the hands inside the rings for almost all of our bench work has made our wider grip bench stuff blow up. So we don't even have to do that much wider grip bench stuff. So we train longer on the bench press and then we just gradually bring out our hands and we're hitting PRs. So, and a big reason for this, and this is something that other people, that people on the internet give me shit for too, your pecs under maximal weights become a synergistic muscle group. They are not a prime mover under max weights. They are a prime mover under sub-maximal weights. So if you're doing sub-maximal bench stuff, your pecs are getting worked well. Under maximal loads, your delts and your triceps become the prime movers of a bench press not your pecs, your pecs aid in it. So it doesn't mean you neglect your pecs or that they're not doing anything. They just don't become a prime mover. They're a synergistic muscle group under maximal weights. So if that's the case, make sure your anterior delts are strong and your triceps are strong. And if your back's strong to hold the positions. Um, so when you start building up these other areas, it gives us a goal. It gives us a long-term goal. And then we start seeing, you know, the feet get a little bit wider on the squat, the PR is coming on the squat, stuff like that. It takes a long time to develop those physical traits, especially where every beginner comes in and they want to squat with their feet close. So in order to get them from being comfortable there to being comfortable outside of their shoulders, there's a lot of work that has to go on there. There's flexibility work, there's strength work at different angles. There's the back angles are different. The stress on the back is different. So there's a lot of things that we need to do to build the strength of those areas. Now they're never going to get to the point of building strength in those areas if they can't handle the frustration. So they need to have these baseline mental skills. So when you look at the baseline of our pyramid, the pyramid that I use to clearly communicate what our process entails, there's nothing physical in there, right? You got to have a student attitude. You got to want to learn. You got to have an effort. You got to have mindfulness. So you got to be aware of being in the present moment, 
judgment free, right? The second we bring judgment in, that's where that frustration and everything else comes in. And that's something that needs to be worked on, right? We need resiliency and we need to be honest with ourselves. So that's where that integrity comes from. So what we need in those situations is just to kind of learn those basic mental skills. So this is why like meditation is something that I recommend everybody do outside of the gym. And part of the meditation process using a mindfulness practice is it makes you aware of your senses. So you focus on your breathing and what it feels like coming through your nose. They'll make you focus on certain sounds and then you can start narrowing it down, right? You can even focus on the taste, on how your body feels in space on the loudest sound, the quietest sound, the, the subtleties or the very obvious things within the environment. So once you start to become aware of your senses and you can start being aware of them all at once at the same time, that's how you develop that proprioceptive skill underneath the barbell. So once you become that aware and you can just feel things, your body can use its natural learning processes to develop the skills that it needs to do. It knows, it knows what it needs to do out of the squat um, or out of the bench press or out of the deadlift. After a certain point in time, yeah, when you're a brand new beginner, there has to be a lot more thinking about it and conscious awareness. But at some point, that conscious awareness needs to go away and you've got to trust your body to do its thing. That it knows it's supposed to keep its knees out on a squat. That it knows it's supposed to keep its chest up and just do it and let the body kind of learn that way. But we can't get to that point if we don't have that mindfulness. Because if we're just always overthinking it and always consciously aware and just thinking about keeping our chest up, we don't hear that proprioceptive feedback. So our body's not gonna learn as well and it's gonna take longer to learn those skills. And then what we end up doing is we end up overthinking it and then looking at our video for the feedback and we're never feeling the movement. It's about the mechanics of the movement, but it's about feeling the mechanics of the movement so that you can feel the, the ground underneath your feet. You can feel the bar on your back. You can wear your eyes, right? There's not much visual stimuli in the sport of powerlifting, but your focal point, right? If you're in the squat, your focal point, it helps balance you out. Like there's just a lot of information coming in and you have to trust your body to use that information to learn to the best of its capabilities. And that's why repetitions are so important. But you gotta be paying attention during those repetitions to actually get that information. So that's where that feel comes in. So that's why mindfulness is so important. And then having that student attitude helps, right? Understanding that when things aren't necessarily perfect in the next repetition or you miss a repetition or something like that, that you understand it's a learning experience, that you're gonna take what's happening now and this is actually gonna be the information that's gonna make you a better lifter later on. And then as we start getting up the pyramid, that's where you know technique starts coming in, skill, confidence, all of these things. But these baseline mental skills are responsible, they're the building blocks of what we need for the next for the next step, which are the building blocks for the next step. And if you truly want to be great, that's what we need to do, is we need to embrace this process of developing mental and physical skills, the foundational mental and physical skills. So I've always like struggled with this other aspect when you think of like Russia, Bulgaria, Greece, they all have these long-term athletic development programs where they start kids at a really young age. So in Russia, they all do gymnastics at like six years old. And then from eight to 10 years old, they might grab a PVC pipe, but they're doing a lot of GPP work. And then over time, the GPP work starts to decrease and sports specific work comes in. So they build these, these big bases. And I'm sure there's a lot of, just from playing sports alone over a longer period of time, you start to develop certain mental skills. Um, so mental skills that necessarily aren't developed when somebody starts or that have even been tested at any point when somebody starts a sport like powerlifting because most people started here in America later in life. So depending on what their background was, and like even for me, I, I had participated in sports up through my 30s. So when I started powerlifting at 32 years old, I had all this athletic experience. But once my performance wasn't where I thought it should be in my mind, I didn't have that necessary, those necessary mental skills to get better as a lifter because I had been good at the other sports and I hadn't been challenged in the same way. So even I, at that age, with a strong sports background, I needed to develop certain mental skills that allowed me to get through the hump. And there was this point, you know, three, four years into me lifting that I fucking hated it for a long period of time. I just didn't enjoy training. It was just frustrating and I felt like I wasn't getting better and I was spinning my wheels. So even under those situations, not having those mental skills made me almost quit. But if it wasn't for coaching in the group that I'm coaching, 
I probably would have stopped doing it and found something else. So, you know, that's something else that made me realize how important this was is because I had experienced it. So we need to develop those mental and physical skills to start building up um, towards that long-term goal of being great um, and achieving our true full potential. So I'm going to use a couple examples. We just had a meet. And so actually, let's back up. So me, even though I'm saying we need to do these things previously, I wasn't communicating that. That's not what was coming out of my mouth or my actions. So I'm sharing PRs. I'm sharing big lifts only. I'm allowing people to chase numbers and grind lift up, lifts out. Um, like e even at meets, it's like uh, instead of putting what, what the what the lifter was, where their stable progress was, where their, their confidence was, like putting the right weights on the bar for their current skill set to demonstrate it on the platform. I wasn't doing that. I was kind of, not that we were missing a lot of reps on the platform, but people were grinding out reps. They were chasing numbers and like, we just weren't focused on the things that we needed to do to get better. So then what happens was you can chase numbers, chase numbers, chase numbers, but at some point, that stops, you either get hurt or progress stalls out and then you don't have the skills to know how to get better. And me and my actions on Instagram, the weight selection that I was allowing for lifters, I mean, if you had a chance to qualify for something and you needed to chase a certain number, like there are moments in time where chasing numbers are appropriate, but you need to have the right mental skill set to actually do that. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for failure later on. And is the goal to just qualify for nationals? Or is it to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be? So even me just putting that goal onto the group of, I think everybody here can qualify for nationals and just voicing that as our main, as our main goal, which I do think everybody can, but that's a mid-level goal. Um, it voices the wrong things because to qualify for nationals, you have to chase certain numbers. And is the goal to qualify for nationals or is the goal to be the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be? And if it's to be the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be, maybe it's better that we don't qualify for nationals for a year or two to really develop certain skills so that when we do finally qualify, we're our best version of ourselves at that moment in time, but we're also setting ourselves up to continually make progress beyond that point of qualifying. So qualifying can't be, can't be the end point. It's got to just be a stop along the way. And when we make that stop, we got to make sure that we've done all the things leading up to it that set us up to go to the next to go to the next level. We're not just running to that stop and then figuring it out from there. And that's what I was doing a lot of. We were running to that stop and then it was just a lot of reacting and figuring, it out, sh figuring out shit from there. So we just had a meet this past weekend. And I think, you know, Alyssa qualifying for nationals back in March, this 2020, 2021 competition schedule is the first time they were really seeing the outcomes of us embracing the process, me being better with my communication, me voicing things better. We have our team meetings where we do a lot of self-reflection exercises individually and we, we discuss certain concepts of training and it, it extends a lot, be, it extends way more beyond this is how you do a box squat. There's a lot of self-discovery, self-reflection. Um, we learn about ourselves a lot more and we learn about what the process entails and what and we came up for, with personal definitions of success and high performance and what it means to be great um, and what our true potential is and just where we are now, finding our weaknesses. We've done a lot of this stuff. So this 2021 um, competition schedule so far is that I think you're finally starting to see the results of all of that. Um, so Alyssa obviously went nine for nine, qualified for national. She put like 20 kilos on her total or something. And all of the lifts were relatively easy. She was very confident. She was calm. She, you know, I always used to be in amazement of the Russians and like Ukrainians when they're squatting and they always look so easy, right? And that's starting to make sense to me, how they do that. Because they're not chasing numbers. They're taking what, their skill set, they're taking the right weights. It's just like this, it's hard to put words on it. But there's this, just this stable performance number that you know what's there and they're putting the right weight on the bar and they're just executing it. Um, and that's what Alyssa's lifts look like. And the four people who competed this past weekend, that's what all of their lifts look like. They're, and, you know, people look at them and they'll be like, well, they were capable of more that day. Well, this is what their stable skill set. This is where they're, these are the right weights to put on the bar. 
right? Stretching it by another two and a half, five kilos per lift. Yeah, maybe they hit more than they miss, right? But for what reason? Why grind out an extra two and a half or five kilos just to say that you did it? Because even putting that weight on the bar, you're sending the wrong message to the lifter at that current point in time. Is there a point to put that extra two and a half, five kilos on a bar because you need to win something or you have a chance to win something? Yeah, perhaps. But at the end of the day, if the goal is to be the best version of this lifter that they can possibly be on this given day, you gotta set them up for that and you gotta send the right message. So by not stretching those attempt selections by two and a half, five kilos, you allow them to build confidence. You allow them to execute really heavy weights that look like openers. Like, and the Russians and Ukrainians are like this. First, second, third attempt squats all look the same. First, second, third attempt bench presses all look the same. And unless they're pulling a third deadlift, that's a stretch for them for a win. First, second, third deadlifts all look the same. And that's, that's what I've seen from this group in all of 2021. Granted, it's only been five lifters, but Alyssa put a lot on her total. And then, so the other four lifters, so there were two lifters this past weekend who didn't hit PRs, um, total PRs. So Lana had hit a squat and a bench PR in a competition. Kelly hit a bench PR in a competition but neither one of them hit a total PR. But we had communicated effectively going in. We had learned about the training process. So for Kelly, her squats were very narrow. They, she'd hit the hole with a lot of, she was very tentative, it'd be slow. Depth was always questionable. There was just not, she had qualified for nationals after the first time they had gone up, but then immediately after they raised them again, and it put her quite a bit behind where she needs to be, maybe 20, 30 kilos or something behind where she needed to get to. And when I'm looking at her lifts and I'm like, I don't really think we can squeeze another 20 to 30 kilos out of the technique that we're displaying on the platform now. And I had this conversation with her. And I was like, listen, this is gonna be the most frustrating thing you ever take part in. But we've come to, we're following a trail and we've come to a dead end and the peak of the mountains on the other side and we can't get across. We literally have to climb back down before we start climbing back up. But when you climb back up and you truly and you succeed at that point, it's going to be a very rewarding feeling, right? Because that's what you're trying to do. You're chasing a feel. It doesn't matter what the outcome is. You're chasing that outcome because of something inside of how you think it's going to make you feel. And so obviously she's still here. So she was on board and it was very frustrating. So instead of her being narrow in heels, we're a little bit wider, we're in flats. She didn't slow up. Her third squat looked like her first. Depth was by no means an issue at any point. Um, so we've been able to build a squat that we can now build with a higher ceiling. And yeah, it took about a year, a little more than a year. And granted, it was only, I think, five kilos behind her best squat at this weight class. So it's right there, and she probably could have hit that squat. But the goal wasn't to try to hit that number. The goal was to display the technical efficiency and to look like a professional on the platform under those heavier weights. And that's what she did. So then she hit the bench PR for her weight class, which was still pretty easy. There was probably a little more there for the weight class she was competing in. Um, and then the deadlift was a lot less than it used to be, but we're really working on just trying to pull without our back rounding and our knees straightening before the bar even breaks the floor, right? So we've really built up a capacity at those angles. So the fact that she's now, she had pulled like 330 previously and she pulled 303 at this meet pretty easy. And there was probably another 15 pounds there. But she would have rounded, and that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for the capacity of the technical efficiency that I was looking for and to challenge that on the platform. And to get out there, we haven't competed in a while. So even though, you know, people will be like, oh, well, her numbers were less, and that's not your job as a coach. No, my job as a coach is to develop their mental and physical skills, and there's always these foundational skills that need to, these, that need to be developed first, right? This is like trying to be a professional baseball player when you didn't play t-ball or literally growing up. So when you haven't developed those foundational skills and then you're trying to put performance on top of a broken foundation, right? Like Louis uses this where he's like a pyramid can only be as tall as its base. I don't necessarily like that analogy that much, but it's fucking true here. If you have weak mental skills and you have poor technique, how high are you really going to go? And you're building, no matter what, you're building performance on a broken foundation. And if you're building it on a broken foundation, it's only a matter of time before the house comes crashing down. So 
our main goal in the in this situation here is to hey we skipped a lot of foundational pieces that we need to go back and we need to make up for lost time so now she's in a position where she can really build her performance up and then lana we had just had a lot of i would say that this i mean she hit the the squat in the bench prs and she probably could have so her total this past weekend was two and a half kilos below her best total ever Right, so the deadlift was about 20 pounds less. She was a lighter body weight this time too, but she definitely had more in the deadlift, but same thing as with Kelly. I'm not chasing a total PR, even as a coach when I looked at those numbers, and yeah, it's always nice to be like, oh yeah, well you hit, you hit a total PR at this meet, and it makes me sound good on Instagram. That wasn't the right call at the time. Even though she has the strength to do that, that wasn't what we were trying to do. We're trying to build confidence and, and develop these fundamental skills. So a lot of this, the training process with her, it was a lot of self-discovery and just learning what it takes to have this high performance attitude that carries into the gym that goes to physical performance. So it's been a lot of like self-discovery and stuff. And what you saw is you saw somebody who was more confident. She said she had the best meet she's ever had because of her confidence and her technical execution and all of these things. And that's what we want. When I had asked Kelly, what was your favorite, what's the lift you're most proud of in the competition? As the smallest lifter in this competition, she had the second biggest bench press. And if there were fourth attempts, she's probably got the biggest bench press in the group. So even though she's the smallest female with the biggest bench, she literally, without hesitation, said the squat was her favorite lift. Because she can see the difference in the technical execution and her confidence in and taking in that confidence in the squats and building momentum with the squats at a competition is probably why the bench was so easy, is probably why the deadlift was so easy. Where previously those other lifts might be hard on the platform because she's so nervous. And then once squats are done, you get that adrenaline dump and now you're trying to bench and deadlift. So it's just setting her up for a better total overall. Um, and it's probably what she's been hitting in the gym. It's a wide stance in flats PR. So it's not that she's getting weaker, we're just building strength in different angles and she's getting stronger at those different angles. You don't get weaker from training and this is like a misconception, like everybody thinks that I'm just using mental gymnastics. You don't get weaker from training. In order for you to display your true strength, there's a lot of things that have to happen. So we're still getting stronger as we're training but the strength that we're displaying on the platform might not match up to what we had displayed before but if we're displaying these numbers on a broken foundation and we're building a foundation here and, dis and displaying a little bit less on the platform, but our ceiling's a lot higher and you're gonna see. And so, so Mike, Mike's been with me for a while and he had competed in December, hit a small total PR, competed in May, got COVID three weeks out, which wasn't ideal, had to take all, a lot of heavy singles in his backyard on grass on a makeshift platform in a cheap rack, but he still put seven and a half kilos on his total. So in a five month period of time, seven and a half kilos on a total is very good. And barring those circumstances, it's great in that. It couldn't be better. Um, but he's been with me for a while and he trains with me. So he kind of gets how it's supposed to be and he's learned a lot over time. So that's why you're starting to see that continual progress. That's why Alyssa has long-term continue. Like Alyssa has been with me 200 weeks now. And we just hit another squat PR last week, an all time squat PR. So it was, I think it was two and a half kilos more than she squatted at her meet in March, which was a squat PR. So we've been together for four years and we're still hitting PRs because we have a strong foundational skill set built. And so Mike, because he's been with me longer, same thing. We've built a nice foundation. We're seeing some nice steady progress. Um, so Lindsay, who was the fourth one who competed, she had started with me. It was 71 weeks ago because she had posted in the... Um, on Instagram. So we had competed at the same meet in January and you could tell she was just a very frustrated lifter, was just in her head a lot, um, lacked a lot of the mental skills that were necessary for her to actually display her strength. So she was chasing a 300 pound squat, kept missing it at competitions, and it's because she wasn't, the world is always trying to give you the information that you need to get better. But if you're not willing to listen to that information, you're just gonna get stuck. So missing that 300 pound squat, it's the world telling her she needs to do something. But she just kept 
making excuses and kind of just doing it the same way without realizing that that's what you're doing, right? You're becoming an enemy to yourself. So over the last 71 weeks, we really worked on, so there were some technique things. She squatted, you know, hands in tight, feet really narrow. So same thing as Kelly. And we started really building some different angles. Um, and we started really working on the mental aspects of being a better lifter. And like, these are the things that you need to do, right? So a lot of self-reflection and a lot of learning about ourselves and a lot of just letting things happen and doing the right things, stacking those small wins. Like we built a lot of those foundational skills and we had trained together throughout COVID. Like we were in each other's bubble, me, Mike and Lindsay, and we were training in the garage and whatnot. So we had all this time to like really build this up. And she had done a equipped meet in October and she set American records in the squat, the deadlift and the total. And she actually finished the year as the number one equipped lifter in that weight class, drug free um, in the USPA. So I think just doing the equipment actually got her to focus on some different things, right? But it, it helped her with her technique and just touching bigger weights. And it's just like this nice, fresh restart in training as you're working on certain mental skills. So you, you're not trying to deal with the frustration and ever, you're just challenged all the time to like, really utilize those mental skills that you're kind of inefficient at at the time, but it requires a higher level. So it was a nice little like break, I think. And then she decided she wanted to do the raw lifting. After that competition, she had signed up for this meet and we had just really like built something up. So the goal going in, so she had squatted 315 in the gym, but even after that 315, I was like, hey, we're gonna hit that 303 that you hit, that you've missed multiple times at competition and we're gonna fucking crush it. That's gonna be our goal. And of course, she's just hitting that three, 305, obviously, because we have palm plates. But that 305 in the gym just constantly, and it's like, I wanna hit more on the platform. It's like, let's stick to the plan. Because there's a gimme five kilo squat PR, right? Fucking own that weight, walk away, and know that you could hit more. Because it doesn't matter for another two and a half or five kilos on the squat at that point, just to say you did it, right? What if you put that weight on the bar and it's high or you miss the lift or for some reason that lift is not good? You leave with all that hard work and not even recognizing that number that you've chased for so long is still not there, right? And it can be a, a very upsetting experience. Not that I don't think she could handle that at this point, but it just wasn't the right call. And as a coach, it's not sending the right message if I allow it to happen. Even though I have full faith, 100% faith she could have hit more weight, that wasn't the plan going in. Like take that weight, and obviously she got COVID three weeks out too, so it ended up probably working out um, just as good, but take that weight and smash it, and she did. We had a two and a half kilo bench PR, and it was easy, same thing. And then two and a half kilo deadlift PR, same thing, it moved pretty well. There probably wasn't much more there on the deadlift because because of the grip, but she hit PRs, a five kilo squat PR, two and a half kilo bench PR, two and a half deadlift kilo deadlift PR and put all of her best lifts on the platform on the same day, which turned out to be a 17 and a half kilo total PR and her first over 800 pound total. So it's just, it's part of that, like there's a learning experience there where it's like all of a sudden if you can put all your best lifts on the platform and be recovered enough to get back into training and continue to build. Cause a lot of times too, what you'll try to do is you'll stretch lifts and you grind everything out. And then you have this huge adrenaline dump, you're more sore. And then, then it's harder to get back into training. Right, but now if we can get right back into training and let's say over the course of the year you compete twice, maybe we squeeze out another five to 10 quality training sessions because that's how we competed. Now, of course, if there's a situation where they can qualify for something and that's a goal and they've earned the right to have that opportunity, then you put it on the bar. If there's a chance to win a national championship or something like that too, of course you're gonna try to stretch your performance to where it needs to be. And you're gonna to try to execute to the best of your abilities under those circumstances. That's a completely different scenario. But not a lot of people are ever gonna be in that scenario, so we need to make sure we're setting them up for the long-term success that they need. So as a coach, we need to build foundational skills. Every lifter comes into this sport with different backgrounds, right? And meeting the individual where they're at is you need to have a clearly communicated skill set that you want to develop in each one of these lifters. And you need to have a way of being able to identify strengths and weaknesses within that skill set. And you need to start with the fundamentals. They need to have fundamental physical and mental skills in order to actually be able to achieve their highest 
potential, right? And for some people, that might be a national platform. For some people, qualifying as a master's might be their highest platform that they get onto. But that doesn't matter as long as they're achieving their, their true individual potential. So I know a lot of people are probably not going to want to work with me because of saying stuff like this, because I don't care about the five pound PRs. To get people to hit five pound PRs is fucking easy. And to get people to hit five pound PRs continuously over three years is not hard. It just follows basic strength and conditioning science. I mean, we figured out how to get people strong in the fucking 70s. Not much has changed since. It's, and we're not going to develop new ideas on how to get people strong. We know how to get people strong. But in order for people to be their strongest, once we narrow down that general information for the individual, that's where, that's where real coaching comes in. Because in order for them to get to their highest levels, there are these fundamental skills that we need to adhere to and we need to teach them and they need to build upon. And this is how every sport is, this is how skill is developed in every, every single sport, except for powerlifting because people start later in life. And some people start closer to that finish line and then they get a lot of volume thrown at them and they do really well. And within a short period of time, they're competing at a, they're very competitive at a national level, they're competing at a world level, whatever it may be, but that doesn't mean it's right. They just started further, further away from the start position and closer to the finish line than the majority of us. It doesn't mean that they're developing the necessary skills for high level performance to be sustained over a prolonged period of time. And the majority of the people aren't gonna be them. The majority of the people are starting on that starting line or just slightly in front of it. And it's our job as coaches to make sure that they have the right skill set so that they can reach that finish line that's a hell of a lot further away. It's easy to get somebody who's closer to that finish line to sprint to the end than it is to get somebody who needs to sustain performance over a prolonged period of time to actually get to the end and to be able to display their true potential. Um, so embrace the process. That's what we do. A lot of times I think coaches and lifters think that they're embracing the process, but they're not. It's just something that they say to try to make themselves feel better, maybe when they don't hit a PR. Or the way that they're communicating that to themselves or to their lifters is not an effective way of communicating that. That they're communicating in a way that PRs are all that matter. Because this is all I share on Instagram, because I'm stretching numbers on the platform, I'm chasing certain qualifying totals, whatever it may be. It's the coach's job to be able to communicate effectively with with the lifter, explain where they're at, explain their strengths and weaknesses, how do we attack those weaknesses and get better. And very rarely do any of my conversations ever revolve around numbers. And for the first time this past weekend, now with Alyssa, obviously we didn't have to talk about numbers because she had to go nine for nine to qualify. And she had to hit those numbers. So it was never like what's on the bar. She kind of knew what had to be on the bar. But this past weekend, for the first time ever at a competition with my lifters, nobody asked me what the weight was on the bar because nobody cared. Because no matter what that weight was on the bar, what they have to do to be successful is the same. Whether it's you know, a squat that's 10 pounds under their best, whether it's five pounds more than they've ever lifted before, how they have to approach that repetition is the exact same. They have to be mentally and physically prepared to do it. And how they go about executing it, it doesn't matter what the weight is on the bar. So once you start focusing on the execution of the lifts, and you start chasing skills instead of numbers, the numbers come running in. So Kelly and Lana, maybe, you know, Lana could have hit a total PR, but maybe they didn't hit total PRs that day, right? But Lindsay wouldn't have if we had competed 20 weeks ago, right? And Lindsay, after 71 weeks, is putting 17 and a half kilos on a total, which is a lot. And you gotta remember there's a, a period of there where we only did equip training, she had COVID, leading up into the meet. Like there were a lot of things working against her, but she had developed the mental skills and the physical skills to be able to train while sick for a couple of weeks and be able to sustain performance and have the confidence to put it on the platform and to have that nine for nine day. Where Lana and Kelly are at a point where Lindsay was a few months ago. And now it's time where we can start building from there. So the next time Lana competes, she's gonna blow her old total out of the water. And then the next time Kelly compete, competes, she'll probably be pretty close to what she had totaled before. I think her total was about 20 kilos less this time around than it was before, which seems like a lot. But you gotta remember, I held her back on some of those lifts. 
So it's probably really 10 kilos behind. And if she keeps developing the mental and the physical capabilities, those foundational skills, and we just keep building on them, that strength hasn't gone anywhere. So that will come back pretty quick. Um, if anybody has any questions too, feel free to reach out. Like I think, you know, I get messages from other coaches asking questions sometimes and some lifters. It's a lot of like me just having conversations with older lifters sometimes too, where they're like, oh yeah, these are the lessons I learned along the way and stuff. And I think it's a really important conversation to have. Um, so you can always reach out to me on Instagram. It's KWK and our team is Pre Precision Power Lifting Systems. And because I have a podcast going that you either can or may not be able to hear me, I'm going to sign off like I do on the podcast. Stay strong, Boston.